the great Dr. Marsh. Oh, my. <laughs> substance of the Father, from the usia, the substance of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made. Of the same substance, homo usios, of the same essence, substance as the Father. Okay? Through whom all things came to be or were made, both in heaven and on earth. <clears throat> For us men and for our salvation, he came down and was made flesh and became man. He suffered and rose again on the third day and arose into, ascended into heaven and will come to judge the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, comparing that to the creed that we say at Mass on Sundays, you'll notice there are many details missing about the second person. The first article of the Father is word for word the same. But in the article on the Son, there are many details missing. Okay? And there's almost nothing about the Holy Spirit except we believe in Him. <laughs> All right. Well, when Arianism, start that sentence again. When Nicaea finished dealing with Arius, the matter was closed for orthodox minded persons. And the majority of the laity fully accepted the decision of the Council of Nicaea that Jesus Christ is true God from true God, light from light, and so on. Of the same substance as the Father. But Arianism did not die. One must not think it strange that after a general ecumenical council, things get worse instead of better. <laughs> Dissent magnifies instead of shutting up. It was the same after Trent. It took uh, the, the bishops of the church and the popes fully 30 years to implement the reforms demanded by the Council of Trent because of the amount of resistance that existed. Well, after the Council of Nicaea, the condemned Arianism had its heyday. Its heyday. Thanks to political patronage. Thanks to political patronage, the emperors Valens and Constantius were both Arians by conviction. 
they insisted on appointing friends of Arius as bishops. They insisted on removing Orthodox bishops from their seats. Now, when the Council of Nicaea was taking place, 325, there was an elderly man who was the archbishop or patriarch, if you, if you will, of the huge see of Alexandria. His name was Alexander. Alexander of Alexandria. Three years later, he was dead. And he was replaced by a young fellow who had been a deacon of his, who had come along with him to the Council of Nicaea as a theological expert. We call him today a paritus. Well, that young deacon who was such an expert was named Athanasius. So in 328, Athanasius becomes bishop of Alexandria, and within four or five years, he's driven out of town political persecution. Arian bishops were installed wherever possible. Orthodox bishops were forced out. And as St. Jerome remarks in a famous passage, one morning the whole world woke up and groaned to find itself Arian. Now, when heresies have political support, Rather than really strong doctrinal support among the Catholic hierarchy, they are fragile. And Arianism turned out to be fragile in just that way. As far as the political support is concerned, you may say that our bacon was saved by an apostate. The Emperor Julian. Constantius at last died. And Julian became Emperor. And Julian still believed in Zeus. Okay. And uh, the other Greco Roman gods, he insisted on returning the empire to those pagan beliefs and practices. And Julian decided that the best way to deal with the Christianness was to bring all the Orthodox bishops back from exile and let them and the Arian bishops fight it out. <laughs> A little bit of worldly political calculation here. Uh, our, uh, Julian assumed that our side would just tear itself apart. <laughs> Well, in fact, the return of the Orthodox bishops rapidly restored peace throughout the church because the support for Arianism was paper thin. And without the support of the Roman emperor, it amounted to very little indeed. So the political support was gone. And also, Arianism was extremely fragile intellectually. If you didn't say that the sun was of the same stuff, substance, essence as the father, if you wouldn't say that, and Arians would, then how are you going to explain the fact? <laughs> that he has such a remarkable standing in the New Testament. He's called the only begotten Son, distinguished from all other creatures, and so on. Now look, between a Son and a Father, there has to be, a, wouldn't you say, a resemblance of nature? After all, the children of men turn out to be of the same species as the parents, is it not so? People do not get dogs, cats, mollusks, etc. So it's hard to imagine how in the world Jesus could be called the Son, the only begotten, and so on, unless he were at least similar to the Father. Well, a large party of Arians admitted then that, well, 
Christ, not the same in substance, but he's, he's similar. There's a close resemblance there. Well, then you had to say, how could he not be God but resemble God? What is there that isn't God that resembles God? Do you resemble God? Are you immortal? Are you omnipotent? Are you eternal? How in the world can you resemble God without being God? Well, this middle party of Angli of uh, <laughs> middle party of couldn't say. They couldn't say. And so their position was fragile. Now, that was a slip of the tongue. But you all laugh because you see how uh, accurate it is. John Henry Newman in the early 1840s was writing a history of Arians. It was a, published as a book called The Arians of the Fourth Century. Writing this book, he came to realize that there's the clearly orthodox party with Athanasius and Rome. There's a clearly heretical party of extreme Arians. And there in the middle are these people who are trying to say, wow, the son isn't exactly God, but he's really like him quite a bit. It's not similar in substance. <laughs> and um, Newman saw in their position an early foreshadowing of Anglicanism trying to craft a middle way, a via media, a middle way between Roman Protestantism. Right? And uh, as um, he said um, in another place, there were the high church Arians, so to speak, trying to steer between the Scylla of yes and the Charybdis of no. <laughs> Scylla and Charybdis were two monsters off of, in Homer, monsters off of coasters. And you had to steer between them and act. So you had to steer between yes and no. What's the middle ground between he is God and he ain't? Similar. Ah, similar. <laughs> All right, there it is. So, <clears throat> Arianism was fragile and could not last. <clears throat> Now, before I go much well, before I go much further, let me say that the next important topic to be taken up by an ancient council is the status of the Holy Spirit. That's why the creed as we have it today has that long third article about the Holy Spirit, which we will be reading shortly. When Arianism was in collapse, one part of the collapsing group said, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. we'll give you Jesus, the Son, as a second divine something or other. But we're drawing the line at two. Three is too many. And these people became known as the Pneumatomachoi. That is to say, the spirit fighters. They were prepared to swallow the divinity of the Son, but not the divinity of the Holy Spirit. They were strong in Macedonia, and hence they were also called Macedonians, the spirit fighters. Now, one of the most important figures to deal with with the Aryan crisis in general, and then with the spirit fighters in particular, was St. Basil of Caesarea. And um, St. Basil's book on the Holy Spirit is translated, it's available, it's in print, it's only about, I don't know, 60 or 70 pages long, and if you ever want to look at a masterful treatise, on the Holy Spirit, you cannot do better. St. Basil the Great on the Holy Spirit. That's the title of it. 
<laughs> I have told you where we're going. We're going into the controversy over the Holy Spirit, and we're going into the specific contributions of St. Basil. But it would be a mistake to go there quite yet. Instead, we have to go back and pick up the problem which now existed on the orthodox side. All right? Arianism is crumbling practically all. But orthodoxy is not yet settled in an agreed vocabulary. There was an important difference in how to express the faith between the Western or Latin speaking church on the one hand and the Eastern or Greek speaking church on the other. I mentioned in here last time that one of the important heresies before the Council of Nicaea had been the Sabellian heresy. Sabellius has said that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct in any way. They're three names for the same thing. Right? And I don't know if I emphasize, but one of the opponents of Sabellius was the African ecclesiastical writer Tertullian. Tertullian wrote an important book called <coughs> Against Praxius. Praxius is not a man's name. Praxius is an epithet, best translated as the busy bee. <laughs> Against the busy bee. There was a Sabellian heretic who came down to North Africa and made himself just extremely busy spreading this heresy. And Tertullian decided to write a book against him. He loved writing books against people. He was very good at it. <laughs> so this is the book against Praxius. And in that book, the Latin vocabulary for talking about the Holy Trinity became settled. Okay. How do you spell the name of the author? Tertullian. Uh -huh. ah. T E R T U L L I A N. Okay? Tertullian. Okay. <clears throat> Tertullian recognizes that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are distinct. But they are within, so to speak, the one divine substantia. So we have Tertullian giving us the word substantia, that is to say substance. For what there is one of in God. Okay. Now, what word should we pick for what there are three of in God? One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. And, yes, exactly, Tertullian picked that word in Latin. And so we have una, one substance, una substantia, and tres, three, per sone. A, E on the end there, and that is the same word that has come over into English as a loan word. Three persons. All right? From the time Tertullian wrote that book, which is about two, yeah, 230 AD, the Latin vocabulary for how to talk about these things in the Trinity was fixed. We're going to say that there's one substance in God and three persons. Among the Greeks, however, the vocabulary was not fixed. In the Eastern Church, there was considerable doubt how to express this matter, what vocabulary to use, and what definition to give to any item of vocabulary that one seized upon. The Greeks decided that <clears throat> the way to talk about uh, what there's one of in God 
was to take the Greek word usia, O-U-S-I-A, usia, which can be an essence, it can be nature, it can be substance. It's a very general word. Well, then what word should one use for what there's three of in God? And you might think that the Greeks would have followed the Latin example and picked up their word that meant a person. The trouble is they didn't have one. They did not have one. The Greeks were metaphysicians, you have to understand, whereas Tertullian was a lawyer. Now, I want the lawyer jokes to take a rest for a while, because this is one case in which we actually know, owe something to a lawyer. Persona was a Latin legal term. Okay. You were a person in the law if you had protected and recognized rights. Eh? So an agent, a distinguished agent, a legally recognized agent, is a person in Latin thought, legal thought. All right. So this is a legally, originally it's a legally recognized agent able to own property, able to sell off property, able to acquire slaves, manumit slaves, etc. Able to marry. Okay. The Greeks were not lawyers. <laughs> they were metaphysicians. And they did not have a word that corresponded to the Latin word persona. Now you might think, well, wait a minute. There was the word prosopon. Yes, there was that word, but it meant a mask. It was what was worn in front of the face in Greek drama, okay, to show what character you were portraying on the stage. Ajax had a certain sort of mask, and if you were being Ajax, you wore that mask. If you were being Achilles, you wore another. The masks also had the advantage that they would amplify the sound. They were large, mostly wooden things, so it was sort of like putting a megaphone over your head, and it made the voices of the actors more audible in these outdoor amphitheaters. Well, the Greeks had a nice metaphysical word for nature or substance, that was Lucia. They did not have a suitable word for person. So, they had to use another word which is in scripture in just exactly one important place but which was also vague in meaning. They decided to talk about three hypostases. Three hypostases. Now one of them is one hypostasis, I-S. If you have several hypostases, it's E-S. Right? Three hypostases. What did hypostasis mean? Hypothesis? No. No. That would be a different word. Hypo. Thesis. Hypothesis. Being something you put down. Like you lay down a coin. That's going to be your hypothesis. Is it something which... Is subsisting? Ah. A subsisting thing? Don't get ahead of the story. The Latin word subsistere hadn't been invented yet. 
<laughs> and it was a totally artificial word when it wasn't. You're doing great, but you're 100 to 200 years ahead of my story. <laughs> That word hadn't been invented yet. And hypostasis was a general word that meant the substance of something. Okay. We have it in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 2, that the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his hypostasis. Express image of his substance. The way it's rendered in most translations. When the epistle to the Hebrews was written, the word hypothesis was not yet a technical term. It was another Greek word for substance. So if you had one word for substance. Was it used as a synonym? Well, it could be. But in order to express the mystery of the Trinity, there was pressure put on to distinguish the two terms. Okay. So that they would no longer be synonyms, no longer be confusable with one another. Okay. And this took work. You could not solve the problem of distinguishing essence I'm sorry, Rusia and hypothesis in meaning simply by looking at the etymology of the word. If you look at the composition of the word in Greek, you've got hypo, which means under, which in Latin is sub, and you've got stasis, which has to do with standing, which in Latin is stancia. Put them together and you've got substantia. So it looks as though hypothesis and substantia are the same word, although in different languages. Okay. Well, the trouble is, if you were Greek and you said, now that we've got the Aryan problem behind us and we're not swallowing the numatomachianism, we're going to say that there are three divine hypostases. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that nice and orthodox? Okay. And you say that to somebody who speaks Latin, and they're sort of clicking it away inside their minds, and the high people stances, that substantia, and it turns out that they hear you say, there are in God three substances. Oops. <laughs> That's hard. We Latins are real monotheists. We confess one substance, not three. I. This problem happened to poor St. Jerome. Although he was a Latin writer, he went off to the, to the East, spent a lot of his time in the East before he was down in uh, Bethlehem doing his Bible translations. He was traveling in Syria and so on, and at, at the time of his travels, this word was being introduced by Moses. And he wrote back to the Pope and he said, I don't know what's going on with this Greek, but I'll tell you what, there is poison hidden under the honey of this word. <laughs> All right. Now, back in Rome, if the Latin word subsistantia had been invented, yet the whole misunderstanding could have been solved. But it hadn't been invented yet. Okay. So we have problems of communication. When does the Greek-speaking East hit upon this stable vocabulary? We're going to say, in God, one usia, and three hypostases. When did that happen? We can put an exact date on it. The year is 360. In 360. Now, Tertullian had been writing, like I said, about 230. So you got a stable vocabulary in Latin. From 230 on, the Greeks get their vocabulary settled in 360. St. Athanasius presided over this, by the way. He called a, a local synod in uh, Alexandria. Once he was you know, 
reestablished in his seat back in town, back in power, called a lot of bishops together and said, let's clarify this terminological model, let's set this up. And uh, under his authority and patronage and prestige and so on, this became the accepted vocabulary in the East. And eventually the Latins figured out that by the word hypostasis, the Greeks did not mean what they meant by substance. The Greeks meant something else. It sounded like substance, but it was something else. And what exactly it was that the Greeks meant was too much for the Latin mind. <laughs> so we're not going to delve into that level of uh, you know, nuance and so on. We're just going to stick to it. That whatever these words mean, the Greeks at this point are orthodox. I mean, yes, except <laughs> they agree with us. Okay. Once matters had gotten as far as a steady, stable vocabulary, the problem could be addressed of what to make of this vocabulary. Okay. And here is the great contribution of St. Basil. And his contribution came against a background of earlier thinking which caused him a lot of resistance. I think I mentioned in passing that in these early centuries, the main philosophical system that Catholic writers had to draw upon to help them solve theological problems was the system called Platonism. Have I mentioned this? Maybe I did. Maybe I did. I don't remember. In any case, you have to understand that Platonic thought was the most popular, widespread, philosophical system in the era of the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, all, if you go all the way back to Cicero's school days, Cicero, first century BC, went to study in Athens as a school boy, loved it. Okay? Then went back to Rome and had a wonderful political career and so on. But in his school days in Athens, he studied Platonism. And from then down to the time of the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So it's over 500 years. Platonism was the familiar form of thought in the late Roman era. There were other philosophical positions, but they didn't matter very much. They didn't have a very wide following. Yeah, there was Stoicism, and yeah, there were a few others. Platonism was the position. And you should also know that many of the early converts to Christianity came out of a, of a Platonic philosophical background. Most importantly, St. Justin Martyr had been a, a professional philosopher, traveling philosopher, and had become an all flags flying Platonist. Finally got shaken on that and took off Christianity. But he always thought that he had learned a lot from Plato that helped him towards Christianity. He's absolutely right about that. The influence of Platonic thought was largely good in the ancient world. It inspired a love of justice because of the Republic and other dialogues about justice. It inspired a vision of order. It inspired a concept of the spiritual and a great taste for immortality. One wished to rise above the passing, decaying, changeable things of the body so as to acquire insight into the permanent realities. That's what Platonism preached as the right course of action for me. And um, um, <laughs> Obviously, if you are in quest of a higher 
unchanging spiritual reality that will take you outside this world of change, breakdown, and corruption. If that's what you really want, then, as you can see, you're several steps down the road to becoming a Christian. So the influence of Plato was largely good. However, the details of the philosophical system created havoc with the problem of the Trinity. And I need to give you about 15 minutes of background to show you how that is so. Now, I'm more or less resolved that I'm going to get you out of here on time tonight. I'm not going to usurp an extra 10 minutes of your time, so, so bear with me. I hope I can get through this. The most famous aspect of Platonism is the doctrine of the forms. Right? Yes. You've all heard of this. The doctrine of the forms. What in the world are these forms? And um, why are why were they okay? Plato says, look, I want you to take the ordinary objects that we encounter with our senses. And you find in every one of those objects a plurality of properties. See this envelope? It's not just red. It's also paper. It's also extended. It also has a flap. It's also terrible, which I won't illustrate. All right? So that envelope has a number of properties. A ball, let's say, is red, round, and rubber. Okay. Bouncing and shining like a red rubber ball. Never mind. Okay. It's red, round, and rubber. Now notice that these properties differ from one another. And so they're named by different non-synonymous predicates, descriptions. Red, the predicate red names redness. And that differs from roundness. So red and round are non, they're not synonym words, even though they may apply to the same object, the, the ball, for example. Now to have a certain property is to be a certain way. So the red rubber ball contains being. It is red. But, said Plato, it also contains not being. Because its redness is not its roundness. <laughs> Being occurs. Give a little. Some people may not be familiar with the word being. I want you to put aside all complicated visions connected with the word being. All I want you to think of is a noun made up from is. 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 Okay. Take the simple verb is. Now, uh, you can make a noun out of any verb. To run. Yes? Noun, running. Verb, is, be. Noun, being. That's all. Okay. We're, we're, we're not going to make any fancy moves with that word tonight. I don't know didn't make any fancy moves. It's just, look, the ball has some is to it. It is red. But it's also got some is not in it. Because its redness is not its roundness. Okay. Thus, the objects we encounter in this world, like everyday rubber balls, envelopes, and so on, are mixtures of being and not being. Mixtures of is and is not. In the mind of Plato. 
Because these things that we run into in this world are mixtures, that's why they're mutable. They can change. And that's why they're secondary. If a thing is a mixture, well, the mixture can change. The ball can cease to be red. If it's chewed by too many dogs, it will cease to be round. <laughs> Not only are the things in our experience mixtures and therefore changeable, but because they're mixtures, they're also derivative. They're secondary. Why? Because mixtures presuppose the simple things out of which they are mixed. So behind the ordinary objects of our experience, there have to be simpler things. Let's call them the pure and simples. Okay. Where are we going to find them? Obviously, we cannot find them in our everyday experience because they're not in this world. You, what you've got to do, said Plato, is close your mind and think. I want you to think not of red things, but of redness itself. Redness itself. You can't see it, but you can think it. It is an intelligible, something you can think, but not something you can sense. All right. Now, redness itself will be a pure and simple. Why? Because redness itself has nothing to it except being red. It isn't also round. It isn't also wrong. It is nothing but being red. It's got no non-being in it. It's all being. It's all being red. Okay? I like to call a platonic form a nothing but. <laughs> Redness itself is nothing but being red. Whiteness itself is nothing but being white. Humanness itself is nothing but being human. And so on for all the descriptions you care to go through. The nothing buts are pure. They're simple. They are the forms out of which other things somehow arise. Now, how shall we describe the relationship between the entity we just discovered? All right, let's take over another section of the board over here. Here. Let's put up four. Four here. And we're thinking about redness itself. A pure nothing but an entity whose whole being is just being red. What's the relationship between this mysterious entity and the stuff in our world. Red flowers, red balls, red ends, <coughs> red envelopes. What's the relationship between them? And Plato said that the relationship is participation. Down here in the world of the senses, we have red ball, Red hen, red flower, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The relation between redness itself and the ball, the hen, etc., is one of participation. P A R T I C I T I O N. Participation. Okay. Redness itself is what's participated in. <clears throat> the things of our world are the participants. Right? Participants. 
Now, you see, go back to the... I haven't got a red ball here tonight, but fortunately, I was given this red envelope. It will do fine. The redness in this envelope okay, is destructible. If I worked on this with an eraser long enough and threw it in a pot of ink or something, the redness of this envelope is destructible. Whereas redness itself is indestructible. Right? So the redness of this envelope cannot be redness itself. It's got to be a share of redness itself. That's participation. So you got the envelope, which is the or the ball, which is the participant. You have the property that you can see, like its redness, that's the share. It's a share of redness itself. Please note, in redness itself, there is also something that's not shared. Something which is not shared. Redness itself is uncompromisingly one because its whole being is nothing but being red. It is pure, like baby, pure. <laughs> it's indestructible, uncomposed, can't be broken down, it's utterly simple. Whereas the things in our experience don't get any of those traits. The things down here are not simple. The red ball isn't simple. It's a combination of many properties. The red head is even less simple than the red ball. She's a combination of very many properties. Yes. So the simplicity and the primacy. Oh my, my hand writing. Worse and worse. Oh, that's horrible. Primacy. Let's say you dunk your heart. Simplicity does not get participated. The primacy, that is to say the status of being a first on which other things depend, that doesn't get participated. Okay? Now, I have given you all you need to know about Platonic metaphysics. <laughs> for the moment. And, well, it's going to be all you need for tonight. Plato thinks that the form exists in its own right. Redness itself is up there somewhere in form heaven. It's up there. And things in our world participate in it. Now, Christian thinkers picked up Platonism because of its good influences and so on, and applied the system to their talk about God. Now, we can make an identification. Okay. The Christian thinkers, of course, are not going to imagine a great big world of upstairs of forms and so on. They're going to put all the forms into the mind of God. That's going to be fine. Except the form which is God. Ha! Just as redness itself must be a form. Likewise, divineness itself. Divinity or divineness or godhood itself. Think of that. It's going to be a Platonic form. But there can only be one participant. Well, here we go. Let's make godness itself. Godness or divineness itself. A form. Okay. And obviously we're going to identify that form with the one who see it. That we've already decided to talk about in theology. Alright. Now what do we do with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? They're derivatives. In that, in that kind of thing. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, all right. We're going to have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as sharing in God. 
governance itself. Three sharers in the one form of gods. Okay? And I presume that uh, this means that the Father is not as simple as godness itself. The Father must be godness mixed with fatherhood or something like that. The Son will be godness mixed with begottenness. And the Holy Spirit will be godness mixed with something else. Right? We're going to have three participants in the one form of divinity, but the form is always a higher entity than its participants. This does not look good. <laughs> we just invented a new God and demoted all three of the first Christians. <laughs> this will not do. Let's try something else. Okay. Instead of putting the Father down here with the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's identify the Father with Godness itself. The Platonic form of divinity is the Father. Okay. It is the Father. Okay. The Father doesn't just have divineness, he is divineness. Now then, don't the Son and the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father? Turn those processions into Platonic relations of participation. The Son is from the Father and participates in what He is. The Holy Spirit is from the Father and participates in what He is. Yes. Does that sound better? I you still have the problem of mutability. You still have the problem of mutability. Well, plainness are very good at getting around that because this is going to be an eternal participation. Not just that, but you're also making the Son and the Holy Spirit independent of one another. You're doing that in less than the bus. Thank you. There's the glaring problem with this solution. Okay. We'll salvage the high dignity of God the Father, but at the expense of the equality of the divine persons. The situation we've now got on the board is called subordinationism. The Son and the Holy Spirit are made subordinate to the Father. That they are divine, that they share in the Father's very nature is not denied, but their co-equality with the Father is denied. What I have on the board is a theology of the great Alexandrian doctor of the third century, Origen. Origen was a subordinationist. Very sad. Is it better than Arianism? Yeah. <laughs> but is it good enough to give orthodoxy a stable basis? No, indeed. <laughs> There was no moving forward until somebody could account for these terms, Osea and hypostasis, without resorting to planets. Somebody would have to come along with a strong, original mind, take his clothes directly from Scripture, and dismiss Platonic thought as whatever. Not for us. Well, that man was St. Basil. St. Basil. Great man. And let me now very quickly give you St. Basil's account of these two key terms. He says, Usia is a word for a common nature. Any nature that's found in many things is a common nature. Think of dogness or canininity. <laughs> it is found in Fido, it is found in Lassie, it is found in Rin Tin Tin. Any other famous dogs? Rex. Rex. <laughs> Common canine nature is found in all of those dogs, right? Similarly, common cat nature. 
felinity is found in all cats. And common human nature, humanity, is found in all people. Okay? Now, the hypostasis is, it says St. Basil, it's the common nature plus. It's not just the common nature. It's the common nature plus something more. Individuality? Individuating traits. Plus. In. Did. Bid. You. A. Ting. Traits. Okay. What is Rin Tin Tin? Common dog nature plus the individuating traits of this particular German Shepherd, right? Okay. Common nature plus individuating traits. I call this St. Basil's recipe. This is how you make a hypothesis. You start with common nature, you add individuating traits. St. Basil was clear. That hypothesis could not consist of common nature alone because common nature does not exist in the real. Dogness itself is not out there in the real. Bye bye, bye, bye. No form of dogness. Common natures are found in the mind but not in the real. If you want to get into the real, you're going to have to concretize. And to concretize is to specify, to individuate, to throw in the details. By individuating traits, the concrete emerges out of the general, and the concrete is what exists. Says St. Benson. Now, in the Trinity, each divine person has his own individuating trait. What is the hypostasis of the Father? He is the common divine nature plus the individuating trait of unbegottenness. He's without origin. That's the distinguishing mark of the Father. He's not from anybody. He's utterly original. God the Son is the common nature of divinity plus, plus the individuating trait of begottenness, sonship. God the Holy Spirit is the common divine nature plus the individuating trait of proceeding in a certain way. St. Basil wasn't too sure how to spell out that, that way. Neither did anybody else. But, all right. Does everybody see how this worked? This is St. Basil's thinking about the Trinity. Now then, if it were our business here tonight to follow the debate on the Trinity further, we would have to say more. Well, I'll follow it one more step. <laughs> you were going to say? Um, how come this Son, Jesus, says then that the Father is greater than he is in the Bible. He was speaking from the point of view of his human nature. No problem. All right. <laughs> common, all right. Uh, common nature plus individuating traits. Okay. Tom, Dick, and Harry each have the common nature of man, right? And Tom has the individuating traits of himself, and Dick has his individuating traits, and Harry has his. So you got Tom, Dick, and Harry. That's three hypostases of human nature, right? Right. Now when we talk about Tom, Dick, and Harry, we say three men, don't we? So when we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, why don't we say three gods? Because they are one God. Oops. But how are they one? Because they know the God. So they see the God. Oh, all right. But now, I mean, we're going to have to. 
St. Basil, frankly, didn't know what to say except to throw off a beautiful comparison. He said, look, the persons within the Trinity are like the colors in the rainbow. Look at the rainbow up in the sky. You see multiple colors up there. Okay? You can see that. But you cannot see where one ends and the other begins. There's a seamless transition from the one into the other. The point is, the, th the colors are undivided. The Trinity is not only of a common nature, consubstantial, but also undivided. Okay. Now, think of Tom, Dick, and Harry. They're divided off from one another. They've got gaps between them. They're divided off. But the divine persons are not divided off. Consubstantial and undivided. That, that, that's where I'm going to end this discussion. Okay, I, got one, I got a question. Yeah. Part of my ignorance, but where did the word divine come in? Who brought that word into the concept of the three? I mean, to me, the word divine really unites everything all on an equal basis. Am I, am I? Well, divine in Christianity and in Plato's thought, divine is the name of a nature as red is the name of a color. Okay. The, the, the nature of that being who is first and necessary and all-knowing and the cause of all others, whatever that nature is, that's what we mean by the divine. What do you mean of that word? Oh, it's uh, no bad, that's on. <laughs> It's an adjective. It's a Latin adjective from the noun deus. Well, it came over into English as a loan word. Okay, we did, we did not borrow. We, we didn't borrow the word deus because we had our own German word God. But we did borrow the Latin adjective divine. Okay? Anyway. Yes. The question about common nature, you said it doesn't exist in the real God, except, so then how does, how does that make one God than the one described with Osea, because it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to have a single common nature in the real, like a Platonic form, then it looks like You've got a, an ingredient in the real, and then you can add the individuating traits in the real and put together the hypothesis. The recipe seems to work. But if the common nature isn't in the real, you've got a problem. Well, perhaps St. Basil simply meant that as common it isn't real. Okay. This is what Aristotle would say. Human nature is something real enough, but it's not out there existing on its own. It exists in each one of us and nowhere else. Okay. I can, I'm a kind of a combination of my human nature plus my fingerprints and eye color and other individual traits. Okay. So perhaps St. Basil was thinking along those lines, it's not entirely clear because he wasn't primarily a philosopher. Yeah. And then we say that the only real common nature, the only being to itself is God. And then you see the others only exist because they are in a minor God, which is also Christian theology. Yeah. The creatures exist because they're in the mind of God, yes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the common nature in the real with the individuating traits. They're undivided, they compose one undivided trinity. That's the picture. Now we're out of time. I didn't actually read to you the text from Constantinople 1, but you know it already by heart. It's what we say in the Creed every Sunday. Okay. When we meet again, we are moving from Constantinople 1 in 381 down to the Council of Ephesus in 450, no, 431, exactly 50 years, and we are going to see the havoc caused by St. Basil's recipe for a hypothesis. It, as long as you're talking about the Trinity, it's great. 
But when we go back to Christology, I default. <laughs> They're going to find it difficult. All right, that's enough for tonight. Thank you very much.